the Wells Reserve is the only national estuarine research reserve in Maine. And I work as the education director there. My name is Suzanne Kahn. And I am today going to be presenting on an expedition I took part in this past October. It was called Wonders of the Western Pacific, Orangutans, Sun Bears, and the Coral Triangle. But first, I thought we could explore what a wonder is. And I went online and these were a couple of definitions that resonated with me. One is a feeling of surprise and admiration that you have when you see or experience something beautiful, unusual, or unexpected. And the other is the quality of exciting, amazed admiration. And I'm going to just add another one of my own. I found that the wonders of the world evoke tremendous gratitude, or at least have the power to evoke tremendous gratitude. So I'd like you all, you can either keep your eyes open or close your eyes and just think about a wonder that you have experienced at some point in your life um, that gave you a feeling of admiration a feeling of gratitude. And if you'd like, you can type type your wonder into the chat. I won't be able to see them until after the presentation because I can't see the chat from my screen here, but um, I thought it might be fun for all of you to share wonders with one another there and think about those times when you felt that admiration and gratitude. So my story actually uh, doesn't be begin in the Western Pacific. Uh, the Western Pacific is that purple triangle on this map of the world. The yellow triangle is where I am here in Maine. And the red triangle is really where the story begins. About 10 years ago, in the summer of 2013, I traveled to Svalbard, in the country of Norway, and um, that was on another expedition. So in the spring of that year, I applied for a Grosvenor Teacher Fellowship through National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions. And I just about fell off my chair when I got the call from them that I had been selected and that I'd be traveling to the Arctic. And so in 2013, I went to the Arctic to Svalbard and that is an archipelago halfway between mainland Norway and the North Pole. And the expedition I was on was called Land of the Ice Bears. And this is a sign uh, close to the, the airport uh, in Norwegian, which basically means polar bears are everywhere on Svalbard. And we did see polar bears and caribou, reindeer, and walrus, and my co-Grovener teacher fellow and I, uh, there were two of us on the ship, we engaged with guests, we developed an educational scavenger hunt about all we were learning while aboard, and this Jeopardy game the last night of our voyage, um, testing the guests, there are over 100 guests on the ship with us, um, about all the things we'd learned during that expedition. So fast forward 10 years, this past spring, I received an email from the National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions team inviting all the Grosvenor Teacher Fellow alum from the past many years, there are hundreds of us now, um, to apply for a pilot program that they were starting pairing Grosvenor Teacher Fellow alums with visiting scientists aboard expeditions, four different expeditions. So once again, just filled with gratitude that I was chosen as one of those four to travel to uh, various places around the world. And my destination was the Western Pacific this past October. So again, if you want to chat in the, if you want to type in the chat box, if you can name one, two, three, or four of these countries represented by the flags on the screen, um, I didn't know what these flags were, what countries these were before I left, but now I do. Um, so if you have any ideas, 
you can type them in the chat. And Kristen, who's my Zoom facilitator, my friend and coworker, Kristen, maybe you can just shout out some of the guesses. If there are any. I'm seeing any. Oh, Poland, Indonesia, Vietnam. Another Vietnam. All right. So, yes, this this one up in the upper left is Vietnam. Below Vietnam is Malaysia. Next to Vietnam in the lower right is Indonesia. And then the blue and the yellow is Palau. Nice work. All right. So those were the four countries that I visited on this expedition. And it started in Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam. And we ended up in Palau. And this is over the course of about 10 days. So here we go. This is my the view out my plane window of Ho Chi Minh right before we were going to land. And the shuttle we took to the airport, my first impressions of the city were motorcycles everywhere. Um, our guide told us that they don't stop for pedestrians. They just go around you. So. I noted that for my walk that I took later that afternoon. Um, motorcycles everywhere. They're cheaper, um, less expensive to have than a car. And so very, very popular. This was the hotel, the lovely hotel where we stayed that first night before boarding the ship. And my first wonder, uh, this bed after traveling 24 hours, I took a three hour nap, which definitely could have been longer, but um, wanted to be able to sleep that night. And the view out the window of the city. Some architectural wonders that I experienced. I took a walk around the city and also the next day our group convened and, and took a tour together. But this is the Opera House City Hall with the former President Ho Chi Minh statue there. The post office, Independence Palace, and the Emperor Jade Pagoda. The first view of our ship here in the river, again, lots of motorcyclists, um, but that's where we were headed. That is the ship, uh, it's called the Resolution, and here I am embarking on this journey. Again, just to give you a sense of uh, my living quarters, this beautiful cabin um, where again, I was grateful for such a comfortable bed after long, exciting days every day. The view out one of my windows, those are the last views of Ho Chi Minh before traveling onward. So that night we traveled from the city overnight to a place called Khan Dao. We visited Kandao National Park, and Kandao is an archipelago of many different islands, and most of um, Kandao is national park. It's something like 80% of Kandao land and sea is part of the national park. First views of Kandao out my window the next morning, sunrise. And the way that we got around uh, when we left the ship was by Zodiac, these inflatable boats. And we were on our way to land um, to a bus that was gonna take us to a hiking trailhead for the morning. So one of the, one of the wonders of Vietnam that I think are unique to Vietnam are these beautiful uh, fishing boats, really brightly colored fishing boats that I loved um, and set against this dramatic landscape. A view from our bus, from the road. And here we are in the National Park on the trail. Um, is the rainforest really wet? Uh, the trail was very slick with algae. And some of the first wonders we encountered were decomposers. This is a 
giant millipede that was traveling across the trail and a giant snail. And both of these are recycling wonders. They take in decomposed, decaying leaves and then poop them out the back end and um, return, return them to the soil as nutrients. My favorite, the star wonder of Condau National Park was this Tokay gecko. There are actually a couple of them that were at a shelter along the trail. And um, these are one of the largest geckos in the world. They're about a foot long. And this is their striking um, pattern that they have on their body. They, like I guess a lot of lizards, they have the ability to release their tail when they're threatened and the tail keeps moving. So the predator goes after the tail and then the gecko can get away. And it takes them about three weeks to regenerate that tail. So one of their amazing adaptations. They also have this ability, you can see this gecko is vertical, it's it's attached on a vertical surface. They have super strong toes um, with sticky toe pads. And I read that they can hang by just one toe. They're so strong. So um, definitely a wonder that that fostered a lot of gratitude within me, that hike. This is the summit of, of the hike, just a, a view of, of the area below. And when we finished uh, the pier that we had gotten off on, it was actually low tide. So we, we realized we couldn't um, get off the island the same way. So we took this, um, this technique of going down these very steep stairs, sort of holding hands with one another as we went down. And the Zodiacs picked us up and, and whisked us back to our ship again for lunch. This fishing boat on the left here, you can see it has lights on it. A lot of them did. And we learned that those are boats that hunt for uh, squid and cuttlefish, which are attracted to lights at night. In the afternoon, we had our first snorkeling adventure uh, at a coral reef on, at Condau National Park. And um, also an opportunity to try out these kayaks, These um, clear kayaks. I don't have any pictures of my own of the underwater world, um, but I will be sharing some of um, folks who were on the ship with me later in the presentation. So stay tuned for those. But we saw lots of different, different fish at this site and other amazing creatures. So sunset on that first day, um, and actually the last sunset in Vietnam, because we were headed across the South China Sea to Borneo. So our next day was spent at sea. This is sunrise from the bow of the ship. Um, anytime we're at sea, that's when my, my role as Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, helping the visiting scientists with their work, came into play. So we'd meet on the bow at 6.30 in the morning and we'd stay out there or in the bridge under some shade until sunset. We had an hour on and a half an hour off. Um, an hour on, half an hour off, and then a break for lunch. This is the team. Jam Acebes is on the left. She's from the Philippines and she is the visiting, she was the visiting scientist on board. And Tim Gardner, who I think is here today, which is so exciting. Thank you, Tim. Uh, he was assisting John with her research, her whale and dolphin research. He's done a lot of volunteer work with her over in the Philippines, and he's from Massachusetts. So the three of us were the team on the ship. And again, we were looking out for whales, whales, dolphins. We also noted seabirds that we saw. And we took shifts. So one of us would be on the right side of the bow, one on the left for an hour, and then one would take a half hour break, and we just do that rotation all day long. So let's see. I have a little video here just to show you what it was like. This is in the bridge. So it was very hot, and spending time out on the bow for too long um, 
was was very taxing weather wise. So here we are in the bridge. And John is at her laptop and turning some data. Tim is there with his camera, ready to get pictures of whales should we spot them. And then I'm on the other side with my binoculars, looking out for whales, fins, or flukes, or any sign of them. And that's how we spent our day until we found something of interest. This is one of the wonders we found in the South China Sea. Um, we did see whales, but they were, um, in this part of the journey, they were mostly fleeting or far away sightings. And so um, I don't have any good pictures to show you from this part of the expedition, but um, we did see this black bittern which is a bird that typically spends its time at ponds and lakes and eats amphibians and fish. And so it was amazing that it was here out in the middle of the ocean. And I later learned, so one of our naturalists gave a debrief of the day um, before dinner. He got this picture of that black bittern. It was taking a rest on the ship and he explained that it was migrating. So evidently black bitterns migrate in October and they migrate south from China to Borneo where we were headed. So it was on the same, the same route as we were looking for, I guess, a pond to um, settle in on Borneo for the winter. That first day at sea happened to be my birthday and I will say that um, I, hadn't, I hadn't spent a birthday away from home since going abroad in college. And uh, everyone made me feel so comfortable. The, the housekeeping and the wait staff, they were wishing me happy birthday all day. I had no idea how they even knew it was my birthday. Um, the naturalists. And so at dinner, they presented me with this cake and they sang to me. So here's just a little peek into that. Happy birthday, Yahoo! Happy, happy, happy birthday! And I gotta sing for the day! Hooray! 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 I was filled with gratitude. They were just amazing. The next morning we arrived in Borneo and um, you'll see on the wall back there, it says Saba Ports KK. Saba is a state in Borneo and KK stands for Kota Kinabalu, which is the largest port in Saba. And when we arrived, we were surprised to see this performance. These local folks um, had this plan for us while we were waiting to get off the ship. And again, here's just a little window into that. Um, when we got off the ship, another surprise, these women presented all of us with a beaded necklace from Borneo, which I'm wearing today, um, these beautiful treasures that they put around our necks as we got off the, the ship. And my impression of Borneo was not this, um, of skyscrapers and cities. So I was really surprised um, when we got into our buses and these were the views out the window. We are on our way to uh, Mount Kinabalu National Park and it was a really mountainous drive. And we reached our destination and um, this is in the rainforest. This is the, the only day that it we had downpours. It was pouring rain as we walked through the rainforest and um, 
we did manage to see some wonders there. Uh, this is the black wood spider and its leg span is six inches to give you a sense of the size. And it's a golden orb spider. It's named such because you can see the golden color in its web, in the silk of its web. We also saw this signature spider, which has a leg span of four inches. And you can see it holds its legs in pairs. So spiders have eight legs, but it appears like this one only has four. It's because it's holding them in pairs. And it's called a signature spider because you'll notice these white zigzags in the web and those reminded somebody of a signature. Um, I looked into it and it turns out they, they build those zigzags because, well, we think, because they're trying to let uh, birds and other animals know that the web is there because, because otherwise it looks so invisible and they don't want their, their web to be broken up all that hard work. Our next stop from the trail, we went over to the botanical garden at Mount Kinabalu. And the plant life here is among the richest in the world. There's up to 6,000 species in this um, national park area. We saw lots of plants. And we even saw a pitcher plant, which we have here in Maine, too, a different species. But these are carnivorous plants that eat insects. My favorite wonder here, I don't know if you can spot an insect in this picture. You can look around amongst the leaves. There's something using the leaf as an umbrella right here. And this is a giant cicada, which has a wingspan of seven inches, and it's one of the largest cicadas in the world. So from Kota Kinabalu overnight, we traveled to Sandakan, and that's the second largest port in Saba on the island of Borneo. So there's some views out the window from the ship when we first arrived, some folks living right on the water. And this was one of the most exciting days for me. I had always wanted to see an orangutan. And um, this was the first one I saw. This was the trash can next to the parking lot at the, orang at the um, Sepalak Orangutan Rehabilitation Center. And this rehabilitation center is um, within a forest reserve that's 10,000 acres. And the orangutans that are here are rescued and rehabilitated. There's 60 to 80 of them at one time, and they are free to roam freely uh, throughout the forest. So they're not in cages or um, enclosures. These were the first ones we spotted from the boardwalk. And you can see it's a, a parent and child there. Super exciting. And from there, we went to these feeding platforms. So at the center, they do feed the orangutans twice a day. And they feed them bananas mostly. Uh, they don't vary their diet very much because they want, the, they want to incentivize the animals to forage in the forest instead. Um, so bananas is the is the main main food there. There were lots of young orangutans with their moms making some fun faces and eating the bananas. And I was really struck by how human like especially their fingers were. I've learned that we share 96% of our DNA with orangutans, and it's easy to see how that is possible, especially I think by looking at those fingers. These are tree-dwelling tree apes. They're the only, uh, or the largest tree-dwelling ape 
in in the world. And these ropes were there to help the young orangutans learn climbing skills. There were some other creatures at the feeding station and the, the name of them, here's a, a clue, this curly tail. Is there another animal that you're reminded of when you see that curly tail? They're called pigtailed macaques, a type of monkey. And they were foraging on those bananas too. And also there was some melon evidently in that, that meal. The macaques had youngsters with them too. And here's a little peek into what it was like watching all of this. <laughs> the arm span of an orangutan is seven feet. Um, so their arm span is actually larger than how tall they are. Um, you'll see this pigtailed macaque over here is looking a little bit territorial. And moments later, this was what we saw. The orangutans also have some aggressive or um, some behaviors that indicate that they're a little bit annoyed. This is... Uh, the mom doing what's called a kiss squeak. And they, they make a kissing sound and pucker their lips like this when they're showing some aggression or, or annoyed at something. In the end, there was some harmony on the feeding platform and, and all was well. And we left with this lovely image of the, the mom and child and all of these banana peels left over from the feeding frenzy. And on our way back on the boardwalk, we witnessed this little orangutan with its mom. And they were just, again, roaming freely in the forest, which was so nice to see. Um, I was sort of expecting to see them in cages when we went, and it was just such a pleasant surprise to know that they can they can move as they as they want. Little video of this orangutan learning the ropes of living in the forest. Okay, um, that center was established in the 60s and um, orangutans are one of the most, in, or are critically endangered. They're only found on Borneo and Sumatra, another island. And that's largely because of habitat loss and also because of the pet trade. So, Mom orangutans are killed and then the infants are taken um, to enter the pet trade. So 
the center is there to rescue some of those confiscated infant orangutans um, and help get them back into the wild. So right across the, the walkway is this other uh, rescue rehab center, but for sun bears. And the sun bear is the, is the smallest bear in the world. It's about half the size of the American black bear. So these are life-size, all the bears of the world. The sun bear is the one bottom center and the American black bear is right above. So you can see the size difference. Um, they're named because of this, this yellow crest on their chest, kind of looks like a sun. And evidently that's unique to each sun bear. So it's a way of identifying individuals. This center was established much, much later, 2008, and it's about six acres, so much smaller than the orangutan center, and there are 10 forested enclosures here. Um, so the sun bears can't roam freely uh, due to safety concerns for humans and for them. They also are um, threatened by habitat loss and hunting and the pet trade. Um, so uh, this, this center, uh, since 2008, let me check my notes here. Um, they have, since 2008, they have rewilded 12 bears with satellite collars and only about half of them actually survived being released. Um, the forest in Borneo is so fragmented that hunters have an easier way of accessing bears and orangutans and setting traps. And um, so it's, a, it's an uphill battle to get these bears safely back into the wild, but it's really, wonderful work they're doing, attempting attempting that. Uh, the sun bear has a really long tongue. It's the longest tongue of any bear. Um, and it's 12 inches long, no, 10 inches long, compared to a human tongue I looked up is three inches. So about three times the length of a human tongue. And that's to help it reach in to get honey and insects. Um, that it likes to eat. Sun bears are about five feet long. You can see on this one. And they have really sharp claws, long claws that they use to dig up invertebrates in the soil. So kind of like the snail and millipede in um, Vietnam, they're, they're recyclers, uh, adding nutrients back into the soil and, and mixing up the soil. Um, this one was eating an apple while we were there. And both the orangutans and the sun bears nest in the trees, which I thought was unusual. After the sun bear center, we went, we went a little drive away and this was really an eye opener into what's happening across Borneo. Forests are being cut down and turned into these palm oil plantations. And palm oil is found in so many different things, um, shampoo, toothpaste, cookies, half of all packaged foods are said to have some palm oil in them. So it's a huge um, commodity and Borneo, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia are the main um, suppliers of it. So one, effect of the forest being cleared for palm oil plantations um, is that that's less habitat for these animals. Um, and one of the animals that is has been mostly affected is the proboscis monkey. So here at the Labuk Bay proboscis monkey sanctuary, we saw some of them in this area. So the story goes that um, the owner of this palm oil plantation saw these proboscis monkeys and realized that they were losing their habitat and felt really badly. And so set aside a sanctuary where they could still live. So right now it's about 1600 acres 
And I think there's about 150 monkeys that call it home. And um, rather than being a true forest habitat, it's a mangrove. Um, so more of an estuarine habitat. And one of the wonders we saw right off the bat from the boardwalk was this mud skipper. And I had never heard of mud skippers, but there are these amphibious fish that can breathe out of water. And I was mesmerized by these little critters. They have these little pectoral fins that they use to crawl around on land. And while they're on land, they breathe through their skin. And then while they're in water, they breathe through their gills like, like a normal fish. Um, but they can even, even climb up roots. <clears throat> you can see this one sort of doing that. We also saw some snakes. This is one snake we saw. There's evidently 160, no, 160, I think it's even more than that. You know, 160 snake species in Borneo. And many of them are green, like this one. I never caught a glimpse of its head, so I have no idea what um, kind of snake this was, but really camouflaged in with the leaves. And the first mammals we saw here were a different kind of macaque called a long-tailed macaque. They use their long tails for balance. And um, like the orangutans and the sun bears and the proboscis monkeys, they like to eat fruit. And so they have a similar habitat to the proboscis monkey, which um, is just this beautiful wonder uh, known for its big nose. And here you can see the large nose, this is a male proboscis monkey, and their noses are about four inches long compared to our noses, which I learned are an average of about two inches. And it's thought that the it has such a large nose because it acts as an echo chamber so that when it calls, it's more impressive to females. It makes it a louder um, call. But got lots of pictures of these noses. It's just fascinated. And again, they just, they looked so human-like to me. They do have little nostrils under their nose, so they breathe like we do. This one was scratching its head and I zoomed in on its fingers. And again, just so human-like. Um, I didn't see webbing, but apparently they have webbing between their fingers and between their toes. And in the mangrove habitat, it's quite muddy. And so they act as snowshoes when they, when they put their webbing out so they can stay on the mud. And they're also really good swimmers. And they use that webbing to swim through the rivers escape crocodiles. The female proboscis monkeys have much smaller noses. The female. We witness them grooming their young and nursing. and drinking from the watering hole. And also climbing trees and, and sort of playing around. I have a little video here of that happening. And again, they were free to roam. They weren't in cages. They just went wherever they pleased. And sometimes right past 
our legs. Uh, these were headed to the feeding station. Again, they have feedings twice a day. Um, the mangrove habitat is so fragmented that they need their diet supplemented by the caretakers. And so they were being fed uh, pancakes, which I was surprised to hear, but apparently that is, uh, the pancakes are good for their digestive system. They have a complex digestive system. Here's a little footage of them eating. And soon after the proboscis monkeys finished their eating, these long-tailed macaques came in for the, the crumbs. They are said to get along very well. And um, the proboscis monkeys are uh, known to avoid conflict. They don't, don't engage in violent aggression and um, are very benign, kind monkeys which it seemed to me that they were. So no problems between them and the macaques. They had a young of their own. So we went at a really great time of year to see different generations. They were nursing as well and leaving their scat behind, uh, helping to disperse seeds into the forest and just hanging out after their their meal. Sunset on that on that day full of wonder and gratitude. And then we we're off across the Celeb Sea um, towards Bunakan National Marine Park in Indonesia. So that meant another day at sea. And here's the captain in the bridge. And me on the bow. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and looking for whales. Here's John with their camera ready. One of the birds we saw a lot of while we were crossing the sea was the brown booby. And I found this on, on the web, uh, this, this description, which I thought was really fitting. Found in tropical oceans around the world, the brown booby is a dashing seabird, both in plumage, a natty brown and white with bright yellow feet and in flight style, which involves swift aerial maneuvers and deft dives. We saw lots of these brown boobies. They live worldwide in tropical seas. They have about a five foot wingspan. So um, large birds, and they plunge dive much like pelicans do, head first in search of fish. You can see some of its yellow feet. And what they were after were these flying fish, which I thought were birds at first. They were these fish that glide in the air for up to 650 feet, um, they were getting out of the way of our ship and the boobies were just having a ball eating, eating these flying fish. We also saw white-tailed tropic birds. You can see their long white tail feathers um, behind them. They nest on cliffs, but spend the rest of their time soaring over the seas. This one, I'll, I'll ask the birders in the group what you think, but um, I think this is a juvenile Arctic tern. It landed on the ship, again, probably for a rest. If it is an Arctic tern, they migrate from the Arctic to the Antarctic, so definitely could use a rest on a, on a ship passing by. And we did see whales. This is a sperm whale. Uh, 
the captain actually stopped the ship for, for this sighting because we are so close. And sperm whales have one blowhole and it's um, asymmetrically located on their head. And so when they breathe, the, the blow is a little bit angled off to the side. You might be able to see that in this photo. This whale was lobtailing, so um, sending its fluke crashing down on the water over and over again. And scientists think that that's a feeding strategy and also a communication strategy to communicate with other whales. Um, but that fluke is about 14 feet wide. So uh, imagine like five recreational kayaks all lined up and that would be, oh no, sorry. That's the size of the sperm whale, about 50 feet long, about five recreational kayaks lined up together. But the fluke is about 14 feet wide. And again, just crashing down over and over again. We also saw a calf, a sperm whale calf. And when the adult dove, the calf stayed at the surface. Sperm whales can dive up to 10,000 feet. We were in 16,000 feet of water when we made these sightings. And so it was really neat to imagine what they were doing down there. They can spend up to an hour underwater searching for squid, giant squid to eat. Um, and they have a thick, one, one foot thick blubber layer to keep them warm while they're in those chilly waters so deep in the sea. It was really special to see a calf with its with its mom. There's Tim on the bow. The sun was setting and we were finishing up our day at sea. First views of Indonesia. And that red trying that red star rather is in Bunakin National Marine um, Park. And it's within the Coral Triangle, which as the slide says, it's the world center of marine biodiversity. And I just wanna read a couple of statistics here because it's so amazing. Um, the Coral Triangle has the highest coral diversity in the world with 76% of the world's coral species. It has the highest diversity of coral fishes in the world with 2000 different species. And six of the seven sea turtle species in the world are found here. So a really special area. And these are photos that other folks from the, from the ship took. I didn't have an underwater camera. So some of them I knew who took them. I gave them credit, but others I don't know whose photos they are. So I'll just thank all of them in advance. But I'll just um, go through these pretty quickly. These are green sea turtles that we saw while snorkeling at Bunakin Marine Park. Hawksbill sea turtles, I'd never seen one of these before. They have a like a hawk-like um, curved beak that allows them to get into uh, crevices in the coral reef. And an amazing diversity of fish and coral. One of the naturalists that was with us was from Australia and she'd worked on the Great Barrier Reef and she said, Suzanne, this is better, um, which was really, I think, telling of the health and the diversity at this reef. This sort of rose-like um, object is um, they're the eggs of a sea slug. And again, just so many fish, it was amazing. On the right, it's hard to see, but there's an octopus there. I was mesmerized by this octopus. I just was treading water over it for a very long time, just watching it breathe. And it actually changed color as it moved across the sand, it went from a brown to a bright white, and then disappeared in the coral little clown fish in the anemone over over here, that orange fish. They have a protective mucus layer that helps them, helps protect them from the stinging cells of the anemone. It's like being in an underwater aquarium. And after that full day of wonders, I thought I was gonna kick my feet up and relax before dinner. 
And then there was an announcement that said we had a surprise opportunity that we could go to shore and actually step foot on Indonesia, um, which we hadn't had a chance to do yet. And we would be leaving for Palau. So off into the Zodiacs, we went to the shores of Bunakin and took a little stroll to get a sense of the community there, very rural community. There's a rooster and a cow. And the locals were so welcoming and friendly. They cut open these coconuts and served us a refreshing drink of coconut water in the heat. And as we watched the sunset, we returned to our ship, the Resolution. And the next two days were spent at sea on our way to Palau. The first day at sea, we didn't see much at all in terms of marine mammals or birds. But the second day, we were treated to a sighting of spotted dolphins. And these spotted dolphins, they were riding the bow right under, right under us, the front of the ship. And they're called spotted dolphins because I zoomed in here, you can see little white flecks all over their body. Those are little spots. Inside their beak are lots of teeth. They use those to catch fish. And they are the dolphin species that are most affected by the tuna fishery. So for whatever reason, tuna travel with these spotted dolphins. And so when the tuna fishery puts nets out um, to catch the fish, the dolphins are also caught. Um, there have been regulations and changes to help with this, but there are still some countries that hunt spotted dolphins. I've read about a thousand a year are still, still hunted around the world. This is a map that Tim, uh, part of the visiting scientist team, put together, and it shows our uh, sightings. So I showed you pictures from the, uh, the spotted dolphins close to Palau here, and then the sperm whale uh, and calf that we saw over here. Um, but there were also some sightings of false killer whales and rough toothed dolphins. Again, for me at least, so fleeting that um, you almost, almost missed them. Um, but this this study and it's had five had... minutes of it's five okay. minutes of one. Thanks, Kristen. I'll speed up. Um, this study had never been done. Nobody had ever been out in these waters to to document what marine mammal species were there. So this was a, a first of its kind and will be used in future studies. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna breeze through Palau. Um, these were the, the first views out the ship window. Palau is made up of 340 islands. It's one of the smallest countries in the world and just beautiful. Um, has lots of these mushroom shaped islands that are eroded on the bottom from the waves and also from intertidal creatures. And one of our one of our destinations was Jellyfish Lake, which is a landlocked lake that has uh, two species of jellyfish that have lost their ability to sting. And we had a chance to go snorkeling with them. So it's about a 15 minute walk through the forest to get there. It's a World Heritage Site. I'm going to pass by some videos of some bird song that we heard on the way. And here we are at the lake. Mangrove forest, moon jellies, golden jellies. These golden jellies get their orange color from the algae living inside them. And it was quite dark, but um, then right before your eyes, jellyfish appeared, uh, apparently millions of them living in this lake. Quite a wonder. Lunch on a remote island. And this little wonder of a hermit crab that came across my, my toes. Very short video of that.
and we left our lunch spot and did some more snorkeling. These days were very full, full of wonders and full of gratitude. Again, you can see the erosion that uh, these islands in Palau are known for, giving them that mushroom shape. And we jump, jumped off the boat, and this was a spot where there were um, very unique brain corals, lots of different colors of them, and giant clams. And just the, the seafloor was just covered with life. The anemones. And off we went to a mud bath, a bay that had really fine white silts that we put all over our bodies and then jumped into the water for a swim, returning it to its origins. And last but not least, we were on our way back to the ship and the naturalists looked overboard and saw these manta rays and said, if anyone wants to jump over with your snorkel gear and swim with them, you can. So. Uh, over overboard we went. Um, manta rays eat plankton, so these are their big mouths here are opened up, taking in all the plankton. Um, this one was estimated to be about ten feet wide. They have the largest brains of any fish in the world, and that was really exciting to have them soaring in the seas underneath us in this channel. All right, last day, we went to P Peleliu, which is an island in Palau, and it was the site of um, a battle between the U.S. and the Japanese, and one of the sites we visited was a thousand-man cave where the Japanese built over 900 feet of tunnels and sheltered here during the battle and treated their wounded that's a first aid site in the cave. Went to some other battle sites. And one of the wonders I really, I noticed were all how the plants are just taking over these human made structures after all these years. Ferns growing up. And there were some critters here too, a little skink. I learned that skinks are lizards with very short legs and long bodies. So they're sometimes referred to as snakes with legs. They eat insects. And this collared kingfisher, which fills the ecological role of a raptor, there's no um, daytime raptors on Palau. There's a Palau owl that comes out at night, but otherwise no raptors. And so this kingfisher, um, with its hunting strategies sort of fills that role of that big beak that it uses to spear its prey. Some turns with deli more delicate beaks that we saw on our way out. And this was one of my last views of the Palau waters uh, on the way back to land. I found this Vietnamese pro proverb and I thought it was really fitting. When eating fruit, remember the one who planted the tree. I have so many people to be thankful for and grateful for. This is a picture of me and John at the end of the journey. Just wanna thank John for her passion for her research without which I wouldn't have had this opportunity uh, to go to the Western Pacific. Also. National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions for creating this pilot program and for choosing me. Uh, the Wells Reserve, my supervisor and education staff for their support. My parents for planting the seed of, of being curious and looking for wonders of the world and, and for having a sense of gratitude. And for all of you for taking time out of your day today to explore the wonders of the world and their ability to evoke such gratitude when we experience them. So thank you, thank you. I see we're at one o'clock on the dot. If anyone has time to stay and, and has questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. I'm gonna stop sharing here so I can see all of your faces. And um, again, if you need to go, please go. 
I don't want to take more of your time, but if you have a question and you want to chat, type it in the chat box or um, I don't know, I guess, Kristen, are there are there questions there already? No, not yet. Lots of thank yous right now. OK. It's so different presenting when I can't see any of you and now I can see all of you, which is such a treat. And Suzanne, I have a question. Yes, I, that's Peter's voice. Just Peter, yeah. Uh, any sign of uh, rising sea level and its consequence? Mm, good question, Peter. Um, you know, I didn't see that. Um, it's reminding me, though, that the jellyfish lake in Palau was created due to sea level rise many, many years ago. Um, there was a limestone sinkhole and then sea level rose and it filled that lake in. Um, but I didn't I didn't see evidence of that there. But, you know, that's not to say it wasn't there. I just didn't. It wasn't pointed out to me. I just know that in some parts of the world, um, islands, shorelines are, are in past retreat and sometimes disappearing. Absolutely. Yeah. And that picture I had um, out the window in Borneo where the, the houses were on stilts over mm -hmm. the water, that made me think of that. And I wondered if they were built that way because mm -hmm. of the rising seas or because just, you know, they're there over the mm -hmm. water. But but yes, that's absolutely happening around the world. And um, my guess would be it's happening there too. It just didn't come mm -hmm. up in our in our conversations. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Susanna. Susanna and, uh, and Susan, we were Suzanne, Susan and Susanna on this expedition. Susanna and Susan were Grosvenor teacher fellows like I was in Svalbard 10 years ago. And then I was part of this other pilot program, but um, they were they were there experiencing their first expedition um, and then sharing it. Oh, beautiful. Wow. I saw things I didn't see on the trip. Oh. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, Susanna and Susan are sharing what they learned with their students back in their classrooms in Massachusetts and somewhere in the Midwest. Now I'm forgetting where Susan was from. Any other questions out there? If not, I'll just chat with folks if they want to stay on. All these people I haven't seen in so long. Thank you so much, Kristen, for, for uh, being here to look at the chat and make sure you were letting people in after the after the 12 o'clock hour. No problem, Suzanne. Do you want to stop recording now? Yeah, let's stop recording. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming, Peter. Oh my gosh, Chloe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Quincy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Suzanne. That was great. Bye. Thank you. So good to see you all. I want to go. I want to, yeah, I want to be on should, that trip. <laughs> you should, Betsy. Well, I've already taken a picture of the signs for two of the primate reserves to send to my travel buddies in New Jersey. They might want to put that on their list. So. Oh, it was just wonderful. I was, you know, I was, I was not sure what to expect because I knew they were like rehab centers. You know, it wasn't totally wild. Um, but I was so pleasantly surprised to see that they could just come and go and not not the sun bears, but um, yeah, so it felt like it was wild. 